Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Public Allies. I'm your host for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Aisha Sardar, and I am the Executive Director of Public Allies. We are very happy to be here today and uh, bring you a special kind of uh, person who has been a judge earlier, and we will be talking about why law is important for everyone. Well, we are almost in November and we are happy to say we have enjoyed every webinar, every round table that we have done. And we have been grateful to get the kind of response that we do. We are going back into the normal life. We want to start the workshops and support groups that we used to do before COVID. We have actually started a virtual support group for women for which we are very happy to invite whoever wants to join. So it is going to be a closed group. It is going to be a confidential group. So please uh, look at the email id publicallies.inc at gmail.com and please send us your emails if you are interested. Now, coming back to the webinar, um, law is man-made and is very important as it introduces justice to the society. In courts, a law is used to settle conflicts among people. The main function of law is to ensure all round development of people by providing security, peace, and protection. Without law, probably we wouldn't be where we are today, but how many of us know what are our rights, what it brings? So to talk more about it, to know more about our rights and how it can help us, we have today with us uh, Jay Chauhani. Let me introduce him before I talk more because I have a long list of the long bio about him and it is quite impressive, let me tell you. Jay Johan is called to our in Ontario, Canada, England and India. His academic background includes LLB and JD degrees from Osgood Hall, Toronto, Barrister at Law from Lincoln Inns, England, BSc Economics from London School of Economics and master's degree from Technical University of Berlin in Development Economics. In 1992, he was appointed a deputy judge and worked 24 years as a deputy judge part-time and retired in 2016. As a lawyer and judge, he has lectured before the, okay, correct me if I'm sp uh, spelling this wrong, Tanjanika Law Society, Bermuda Borer Association and Universities of Chandigarh, Gujarat, Ahmedabad University of Management, and has done continuing education programs for Ontario lawyer and paralegals and Bermuda Bar Association. He has a mentorship group for lawyers where he supports lawyers who want to launch legal practice and inspires them to achieve their best in their careers. He also works with a charity called Friends Outreach, where he wants to reach out and assist others who are in need in Canada and abroad. He has written many articles in law in a lot of magazines and in different languages and has won an award as a legal writer from the Ethnic Journalist Association. The award was presented to him by the federal minister, Jean Augustin in 2006. He, he turned, then he turned his mind to writing nonfiction in the last few years. And he says that he's still learning. Oh my God, you're still learning. Then what are we doing here, Jay? Welcome to Public Allies. Thank you so much, Aisha, for your wonderful introduction. And I'm very pleased to be part of your group and answer some of the questions that you raised uh, in the question that you want to raise today. Yeah, we, we, we are privileged to have you and I'm looking forward to like, you know, we were talking, we are going to have a series of uh, these webinars and we look forward to getting, knowing more about law and digging into that knowledge of yours, which you have acquired for so many years. I hope you're ready for that, Jay. <laughs> I am very much ready. And uh, I think that uh, basically, why should we get to know law? As you pointed out, Aisha, that uh, the legal system mm -hmm. is the hallmark of civilization. It's a basic conduct in the society that we are required to observe in a civil society. 
So I think it's very, very important that we understand that. And I think that, that some countries more than others are more ready to understand the legal system and work with it. And I think that some societies are not so ready and you will see that when the legal system is not used appropriately, it causes a lot of injustice to people living in that society. And we are very fortunate that Canada is one of those countries where the legal system actually works. And therefore, it's possible to predict what you can do and, and get the support of the court system if you know the law. And if you want to talk about the Indian uh, uh, society, it is very important to recognize that in the Indian society, I think the legal system has not been as effective and therefore people uh, have an attitude that to go to the lawyer or the legal system is not a good thing. And therefore they miss out on understanding the legal rights and asserting them in the legal system. And I think you mentioned that I did lectures in the University of Gujarat Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I made a point of saying to both the professors there, as well as the students, that uh, in the countryside of India, for example, women in particular are not even aware that they have legal rights and how to assert them. And there are many countries where the legal system is not effective, and therefore people lose out on the rights and not even aware of the legal rights. So I think it's important for uh, your audience, and I'm very pleased to be with you to, to bring that message across that uh, the understanding of the legal system is fundamental to not only the growth of society, but the growth of the individual in that society. It enhances your confidence, it uh, makes you feel more secure, and, and enables you to advance your particular agenda in, in a society where you understand the legal system. Yeah, very well said, Jay, because many people don't understand that, that it is just not important for the society, but your personal growth as well, if you know the legal system, right? Yeah. So so that that actually helps me get into my second question that I have for you. So tell me some of the common rights that everyone should know, because people don't understand that they have rights. They have responsibilities. Yeah, the rights bring some responsibilities, but what are their rights? Well, I think there are too many legal rights to, to enumerate here in this short meeting. We'll do a separate program, if you like, to enumerate specific programs. So, so just to give you the history of Ontario, mm -hmm. about uh, 30, 40 years ago, Ontario adopted the Human Rights Code and created the Human Rights Tribunal. So yeah. there it began by understanding, in fact, it was an Indian group, actually, you know, somebody was thrown off the track on the railway track in the underground, and the Attorney General at the time created the Human Rights uh, Code, as well as the Human Rights Tribunal. And even when that person was convicted, he appealed a decision to make a point that if you discriminate by on the grounds of a person being a different color, then the punishment should be higher. And I very much agree with that idea that uh, all people should be treated equally. And what has happened, unfortunately, Ayesha, in the history in the last two, three hundred years, we suffered the colonial history, even in India, even in Canada. I think what you see in the residential school system, that there was a, an ignoring of the rights of the children the, the, in, in India, for example, that the economy was disrupted and England industrialized at the expense of India. And then the Indian people began to, to begin to see themselves even in their own country as second class citizens. So the fundamental right you have, Aisha, in my view, in any country is the right of what I would say in one word, equality. And, and if you see that you do not feel yourself to be equal, then you have to fight for that equality. And I have actually, you pointed out that I wrote that novel and I mm -hmm. wrote this novel to explain that actually, that to give you just my example. Can you say, tell us the name of the novel, Jay? The novel Thanks. is Love in the Empire. This is the story of the British Empire, how it affected my life actually. And so I was a barrister, as you pointed out in England, 
But even if you're a barrister, you must get the cases from the solicitors and they would not refer the cases to you. So I simply walked out of the country. And when I went to get my degree in Germany, I only stayed uh, four days in England. And I said that uh, if I am qualified and I'm not treated as an equal, I do not leave the country. So although I'm a British subject, I left the country, came to Canada, and with, I was able to do more here in this country. It's not that this country was without challenges. And I, yeah. I, I had to overcome the challenges. The challenges are not only the society, which must recognize that I, I have to speak in their language and then get the refinement in the sense of, of technical understanding in the language and be able to be uh, expressing myself in the language at the level of fluency, if not equal or better than the people who recognize to be authority on that subject. So it took me a huge amount of effort. And I think that uh, the message that I want to bring across to your audience is that this is your struggle to be equal and then to show to other people that you can be not only equal, but more than equal if required to illustrate what you can do in this society. So that is the challenge that I'm facing that I want to promote in my mentorship group, in my speeches, in everything that I do. Amazing. Yeah, it, it's so true. Each one of us has gone through those uh, challenges and, and we have faced them. But what's important is standing by them and understanding that what we can do and what we don't have to do. So even in law, there are some do's and don'ts, right? Um, people take it lightly. They understand, like, I want to give you a simple example of uh, cyber crimes and cyber bullying right? People think that uh, they can get away with it. Even teenagers think they can get away with it. They can write any comment and it will not be tracked or if people you deleted, it, it's deleted from history, which is not the case. There are certain laws attached to it they're, they're, and they can get into serious issues, even pranks, for example, right? So, Tell us a little bit about what are, what are the do's and don'ts in law? Like, yes, I, I understand I'm asking you like, you know, why bigger questions which don't have like, you have, I have to be specific, but this is just introduction to law. I want people to understand that it is not scary. Law is not scary. If you know it, you can face it better. Yes, I think that there is not an easy list to create of the do's and the don'ts in the law. Actually, there's an ongoing exercise for you as a non-lawyer, you're a psychologist. Yeah. And even for me, having spent and I've done many, many lectures in many universities and in the law association that you pointed out, but the, the understanding of the law is not a, a situation of one time a quantity of knowledge that you can gather. Mm -hmm. so it is an ongoing exercise that uh, you simply have to keep going to enhance your knowledge. And there is not a clear list, but it, you know, just to take up that example, actually, the cyber crime. And uh, I remember doing a file for somebody in which the government delayed the payment of a certain amount of money on a transaction. And he wrote a very negative comment on the Google for, against me because he couldn't make it against the government, so he made it against me. It was not my fault. Yeah. That comment may still be sitting on the Google. So what can you do? So all the things of do's and don'ts in the law are not written out in categorically in the in the legal system. So the cyber crime, the best example is that there was one girl in I think Nova Scotia, British Columbia, actually, that uh, somebody took a picture of her. And then it was exposed on the social media and she committed suicide. So I think that it's an example that as the technology changes, the do's and don'ts of technology as it affects the individual in rights of privacy, for example, are to be learned and to be changed as we move forward. As you can see, the Facebook is facing challenges in different parts of the world. In China, it has a different uh, uh, perspective. Uh, it, I think that Mark Zuckerberg appeared before the Congress committee to explain, and it is now a, a, a medium that is overtaking a lot of the national newscasters like BBC, CBC, etc., 
and therefore it begins to affect the rights and they become the people through which people can influence the societies, the election process as Russia tried to do with America. So the do's and don'ts of the law are not categorized. So in the civil law, for example, of the, the, which was created by the French people, which was a civil code to say that this is the law and therefore the state and the power of the state dictates actually what should be done in the civil and criminal law. In the common law, it is more an evolutionary process that we have in, started in England and then brought to Ontario, but outside of Quebec, the rest of the country is all civil, uh, civil law or common law. There, the rights evolve with the parliament and the case law, and those are the do's and the don'ts of society as we move forward. And our society is not a static structure that we can say that this is the law today and it will be the same forever. It is not actually. In fact, I brought my textbooks from England thinking they would be the same within a very short time that they came out they of change. state. And then I had taken so much trouble and I had to really, they are now museum pieces now actually on my shelf. So, so I would say in, in a short uh, phrase, there is not a, a short list of do's and don'ts, but I look forward to working with you to bring the understanding of the basic principles of law. But most important, if I can point out Aisha to you, is our attitude to law. And that is rarely discussed in the law school by the lawyers and by the politicians and people who deal with the legal system. When I say attitude is that, I can give you the best example is that, for example, in India, therefore, the, for the legal system is not effective. People don't write their wills. And then for generations, the relatives will not talk to each other because they yeah. took somebody's property and they didn't prepare the will properly. So ignoring the legal system, an organization of society ignored, and then you behave. And I remember so I was in a scooter in India, by the way, just tell you, so, and I had a distant relative who was on the other side driving mm -hmm. in Gujarat. And then the relative didn't talk to the other person. And I recognized the person. So I said, how come you didn't talk? Oh, because they took over this property and never explained uh, their, their conduct. But it was the fault of the person who didn't write the will properly. So so most important thing that I can say about the law is that your attitude, attitude to understanding the law is fundamental that uh, if you want to behave ethically, it also means you have to behave legally as well. So if you ignore the legal system and try to, to get ahead in life by finding ways unethically and then hit on the wrong issue, I think it is not a very good way to develop yourself or the society at large. So what is my message actually that it is a question of, of understanding and having an attitude that you want to observe the laws to improve yourself and the society both at the same time, rather than looking for what I call a shortcut to making success. And the success uh, that you are a member of actually, the success, Leonard for Success is an example where the success is measured by the dollars actually, but it's my view that uh, I think the dollars may be relevant in, in the economics of the society but the success in life is not just based on how much money you make, is that how much you can do for yourself and for society, which may not always be measured by the money. So I think yeah. so my, my most important message in this uh, discussion with you is that the bottom line of the behavior is law, but the ethical behavior, the compassionate behavior, your integrity, are honesty, are your personal traits that sit on top of the basic legal system that tells you what to do and what not to do. So I think there's these characteristics of, of ethics, behavior, integrity are above the legal system, which are important to observe. And what I saw that because India was put in a very, very, I would say India was a very major civilization actually for in a thousand five hundred years, it was a leader in economics actually. And in, in the output that it produced, almost 25% until the British came, even the Muslim period did not impoverish India as much as the British did because they industrialized their society at the expense of India. 
Yeah. So what has happened in Indian culture, if you want to take just one culture as an example, is that the Indian people very often they come as immigrants, they're looking for a shortcut to success. And I'll give you the best example. I became a member of an organization that says that if you are, you know, change, for example, giant, Poparlal uh, Chauhan is my real name, with the Indian name, but nobody <laughs> could remember the whole sentence of the, of the name. So I just called it Jay Chauhan, actually. So mm -hmm. I think, and he suggested, this person suggested that you just change your name and then apply with a different name and you'll succeed. And I think there is some element of truth that you will relate easier with an Anglo type of a name. But on the other hand, it does not remove the obligation that I will always look Indian. Therefore, if I'm going to be underestimated, I will have to perform and I'll have to yeah. outperform. And therefore, I, in the in outperforming other people in whatever I am doing, it is very important for me to recognize that I do not take a shortcut to achievement process. But I think that attitude in some Indian people, you know, that is that let's get ahead in Canada by making a shortcut. I don't agree with the shortcut theory of getting ahead. So in other words, honesty, integrity in our achievement should be reflected in what you achieve ethically in the society because then everybody benefits from what you do. It may take a little bit longer, but yeah. it is the right path in the long run. It's so true. So many points to cover here. So yeah. I, I agree that, you know, like we like our technology to be upgraded and updated and change. Similarly, the law changes with every, um, uh, you know, every new a year or you know if, if when the society moves ahead the law also changes so you have to be ready for that change as well plus the attitude change it is so important to understand that the law is made for your benefit it is made so you can live peacefully you can live that secured life so having that attitude change is also important very important not taking shortcuts but understanding that your work has to speak for yourself. Like you said, the name alone, if you change the name alone is not gonna make that difference, but what you're doing, what are you portraying, what your work is speaking, that actually changes how people look at you, how they perceive you. And in the long run, it will be rewarded for sure. I agree with everything you said, Jay. So there is no two ways. There is no conflict here. Am I speaking the legal language now? <laughs> I think you should, you're a psychologist, but you, I think you've got very good understanding of the legal system. So oh, I, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I, I would look forward to working with you in your charitable organization and all the groups that you have. And I want to, I think uh, the most important message is that the world got organized or disorganized, if I may say so, Aisha. Yeah. By the way that the imperial powers that includes England and France, industrialized their society, first yeah. England, and then brought industrialization to other countries. So we have a major pollution problem today. But along with that industrialization, they also brought a small island controlled the whole of India. It did fundamentally change the perception of Indian people around the world. And they're doing exceptionally good individually when they go to a foreign country. Like for example, Sundar Pichai can be along with many others, the top of CEOs on big organizations. But what has happened is that the, got, the world got color coded. So yeah. when I came to Canada, I had to prove myself. I was the only brown person in the entire law faculty. And I was very, very disappointed actually, you know, that uh, I'm the only one. And then in, in my time, there are only about uh, 40, 50 lawyers. Today, there is a huge, huge difference. So I think that there are certain issues that we as Indian people ought to recognize in our history and the history of today. Today meaning that the year 2021, we're having to struggle to say that the color is not an impediment to equality or achievement. And therefore there is resistance to understanding that part. So how do we deal with it? Not by anger, but by illustrating what we can do and what went wrong in the color coding history of the world actually. Because it was the message was conveyed very silently that if you're white, I have to call you sir. And if you're white woman, I have to call you madam. That madam and the sir designations 
were a part of the humiliation of Indian society, which we are overcoming even here in Canada. And if you yeah. look at the residential school issue, Canada is not emphasizing that it's a part of the broader problem. The broader problem being that you created a silent color coding of the world in which the people of different color had to prove, even gender, for example, you know, I think that some, we were the one chapter on the, on the gender. I yeah. think that gender is one of those examples where uh, I think that what, where, what happened was, uh, I think society, especially men, forgot that half the population is women. Yeah. They need to contribute to society equally, which only I would say in the last 30 years we have recognized that. So that is yeah. a mistake on the part of humanity, right, in the evolution. So we need to correct that thing also. It's not just a problem of the color coding system I was talking about. The whole human society have made an error in my view, in terms of saying that if you in the cave age had a woman looking after the children in the cave and the men went out hunting, that the men create dominant role. Only yesterday I watched a program in which I discovered that in the hunting days of the human evolution, the women were equal participants there. Absolutely. So through up and down, so recognizing that we do not look for differences to recognize the talent and ability of the people. Rather than suppressing the talent of the people, we want to, in your programs, we want to liberate the ability of the person to achieve the goals and illustrate that gender or color or any other impediment that is imposed on the by the people on the, in individuals unreasonably, like for example, the black people were enslaved. Yeah. And so to liberate them in 1774 in America or in 1833 in, in uh, England, those I might not be exact on those years, but I think that when when those issues were of liberation are celebrated, but what is not understood that if you tell in Abraham Lincoln says to the black people that from henceforth you shall be liberated that liberation is not in the form of making a statement legally that you're equal. You have to go inside the mindset of the people. So in the mindset of the people, the black always remain black. And you can see that condition as of today, that the society is not even recognized that they can achieve and can be the lawyers, journalists, politicians, and everybody you know, that, they, that they ought to be allowed to become. So the development of human societies, in fact, uh, should recognize that the labels we created in different ways for gender, for the color, for the status of a person to be, for example, a slave, are the labels, are the labels that we need to change in our own psychology to begin with. And then we can bring it out to the, to the other people and use programs like yours to propagate and advance the sense of equality and empower them to become more equal in their mindset first and then the perception of society next. Completely agree again, like what is important when you're going into, when you're going into a surgery, what is important? If the surgeon knows what he's doing or the what is his color or what is his gender right what is important is if he can save the life of the person on the table or not yeah. so similarly in every profession in every walk of life i feel like the importance should be given on the capabilities and the skills that a person holds rather than on the look in how what, from where that person comes so we, we are talking about like, you know, we have gotten into uh, what the do's, don'ts. Now, I want people to know, at least take back, are the all, do all countries follow the same human rights? That's my question to you. Do all societies? Society? Yeah, the society, like different countries, everybody mm -hmm. has common human rights or is it like different for each country? No, so let me, let me, this is a very big topic actually. See, it's a very, very important topic I share as well. Do all societies recognize equally? No, they don't. Let me give you my example. I was born in an Indian family, Gujarati family. Mm -hmm. You know, India has many different cultures within one country. 
So if you look at the culture of Gujarat and you confine your, yourself into that culture, I was brought up with a high degree of modesty and, and therefore I had even the challenges to speak up in the courtroom. And I was, when I first became the judge, it was difficult for me. It was not easy that you think that it is comfortable to be a judge and yeah. to be a lawyer, what to do. <laughs> Now sit down or you don't speak, you know. I know. Very powerful position. Very strong position. And I had to adjust to that one. So my assumption when we, my parents migrated from India to East Africa. So my assumption was that all societies are based on what we see in our family. And it's not the case. For example, if you marry in Indian society, for example, you know, I say that even today, a large number of people in the countryside outside the big cities have arranged marriage system. Yeah. The fact that your right to choose your spouse was never understood by me, actually. And I rebelled, actually, <laughs> <laughs> to understand that why is this the norm that you can't make your decision yourself? So I think, I, I, I think my answer to your question is that we assume that the world reflects a value system that we are used to. And the problem and the challenge in life is understanding the different value systems and creating a norm that is reasonable and compatible with individual development along with the development of society. So religion, for example, came along at uh, when the human society settled and they created the norms to think that they ought to behave correctly. So all the books that you see right from the Gita to, to Quran to the sort of Bible, they prescribe the right things. But as you can yeah. see, that they ended up doing the wrong thing. That means these religions have fought with each other. I mean, the Second World War and putting Jewish people into concentration camps was a religious act, in my view. Although it's not emphasized that way in the history, it is a religious view. So uh, do all societies have that same norm? I don't think so, because what happens is that we automatically absorb certain values from the way our family brings us up. Then we see the society around us and we absorb those values. And we assume that those values are universal and that they are, they are not actually. So I think what we have to do in the current history is to understand all the religions, all the societies and the value systems and reach your own conclusion what is right and wrong. And then we not only behave in the code that we think is correct, but we, we also pronounce and, and explain to other people the right kind of uh, code of conduct, which is correct for, for the people at large. And it's happening in a very good thing that we have the Zoom program, we have the social media, that we can spread the word around very, very quickly. Yeah. So, uh, I feel there is a revolution after the social media that, you know, people are become very outspoken and people are understanding, like, you know, one of my favorite human rights, according to me, is freedom of speech. Many people didn't have the platform, but with growing technology where people can just switch on their phones and speak where their mind, it has become more revolutionary to like, you know, you know, say what you're thinking and what you're feeling if the other person isn't agreeing you know these days people just pick up their phone and they st they record it so uh, it, it scares of you it is used again like you said it can be used in a good way it can be used, used in a bad way like religion was used in a good way and a bad way so um, it can be the messages can be good and bad both so I look at the positive side of it. I feel like it has given um, it, it has given voice to people, the new technology, it has given more freedom. So that's one of my favorites. The, my second favorite is gender equality, which hasn't happened yet. So I, I would love to see a society where all genders are equal and they're given equal rights in their, their they're given a equal place in the society. So. That's my two. Which are your two favorites? Yes, yes. I think that I, I agree with your, your uh, view that uh, the gender equality is very phenomenal. I wrote an article on it very not too long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the gender equality and why it is important, actually. And then I, I almost, you know, to make it polite, actually, that was 
forgotten in the history of mankind that the women were there and yeah. equal, but they were not allowed to participate in almost all societies. You know, the patriarchal society is actually which meant that the man or male was a dominant figure in the family or even society. And if you look at the leadership today, that the only certain countries like Sweden, they have, uh, you know, basically accepted in politics equal number of people who are uh, <clears throat> both uh, in politics, journalism, law, etc. These are the professions that create, help create equality. But apart from that, if you look at uh, America, they never had a woman president. In they never, yes, it's so surprising. <laughs> so this is a country that claims to be all equalitarian and democratic, they have not achieved that yet as of now. Yes. It's very important to, to, to recognize that. So I think that I'm very really a big fan of the, the idea of the gender equality because in my view, that's the biggest, if you can say, mistake of the humankind to understand that if they had allowed, say for example, all the countries to be equal or people, gender to be equal, then we would have been in a very different position in the terms of development of the people. So only in, in the recent years, I mean, I, in my lifetime, I have seen the biggest change in the gender equality. And it's the first time in probably in history that the majority of societies are beginning to think that if there is a woman, they can do anything they want, right? From the top professions to going even in the military to doing any kind of uh, achievement, you know, and I think uh, it is now permissible. But why was it not permissible? You have to question that, to understand that, and then address that issue. You can't change the past and the history, but we can change the future. If you understand that history, what was the mistake? And let's correct it now and as quickly as possible. Yeah. You, you, I, I feel like, you know, the world lost out on so many wonderful minds just because women were not given that choice or a chance, I would say. And like you rightly said, women went for hunting along with men. And once they became pregnant, probably, you know, they were pushed aside. They were like taking care of the kids. And that's when the society changed. Like, you know, they were, they were not recognized. Many a times we read on um, the census that uh, females are much more knowledgeable than the males, but I, I, I'm just saying gender equality, why are you not making use of that intelligence? You're wasting it or you wasted it earlier. I feel the society is changing. Like you rightly said, there's this attitude change in the society. They're recognizing it, but not everyone. It'll take time, but slowly and surely it is going to happen. I, I, I still have hope. <laughs> I think it, it is changed and it will change, but I think it's not changed sufficiently in my view. Even yeah, since. sufficiently, yes. I think the Western societies are sort of uh, trying to show that they are ahead in that thing. To some degree, they are actually. Because you see, if you look at the social structure in many societies, uh, some societies by religion designate the women as being less than equal. For example, if they're in the courtroom, their evidence is equal to half the value of a man's evidence, for example. Really? Yeah. yeah wow. in, the, in the Middle East, there, there are societies in which the, the uh, you know, it's even to today. Actually, it's not just a question of history. It's right now that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, in Saudi Arabia, the women were not allowed to drive until recently. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I mean, how can you be free and go where you want uh, unless you uh, have a driver's license and say, okay, now there's a car and you can go where you want. But, but I think that uh, these are examples that are happening even today. So how do you change the society? And if you are uh, in Afghanistan, for example, and want to go to school for, as a woman, then what are you supposed to do? If you start a revolution to say, no, I do want to have education. So it's not possible to change the world overnight. So yeah. therefore, the first thing and the step is that the understanding of the principle of equality. And I think that uh, you put it right to point out, if women became pregnant, actually, that was the way in which human societies existed. So therefore, women assume the bigger burden, if you like, of uh, reproduction, and therefore they were uh, not- Confined to home. 
Yes, <laughs> I'm wrong. So if you have been wrong, I'm going to look at your live example today. How do I deal with the question that if you have women, so for a long time in my group, I never even recognized that there were men or a woman. So I remember the comments that I got from my group actually that, uh, you know, you know, so I think that uh, the main thing that I recognize is that you can make them equal. But one of the members now is about 15 years ago, I helped her to become a lawyer. She's not a very successful lawyer in, in Richmond Hill, but she became pregnant. So I wrote to her, I said, now that you're in a small law firm, how are you going to manage the practice and you have to still compete, right? So what will you do? So I think I'm addressing that issue in my own group, actually, that if you are in, a, in one of the top professions, you know, like law and medicine, and you have to carry out your duty, what would you do? So I think we have to accommodate and create adjustments in society to address that issue. Absolutely. That, that you can't just have competition as the only model for yeah. expressing your success or ability. So we have to create rules that accommodate the human needs, including yeah. reproduction, actually, you know? Yeah, and it is just not the, uh, uh, it, the responsibility should just not fall on the mother, which has been happening. It should fall on both the parents, right? So mm -hmm. in that way, you're giving them equal, e you're giving them not only e equality, but you know, you're taking care of the equity part also. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, talking about uh, actually Saudi Arabia, I was watching a, a documentary today. Mm -hmm. Riyadh, uh, Saudi has um, allowed women drivers, women women getting driving license now. And in Riyadh and Jeddah, I believe, or Riyadh and uh, another place, I can't remember now, they actually have malls where people can go. They don't have to wear the hijabs and uh, it, Yes, it was very surprising. I, I will send you the documentary today. You can watch it. It, it was very uplifting. And the du new regime, uh, there are cinema halls, which was not heard of in Saudi Arabia. And um, it was actually um, a person who was having his date. Mm -hmm. So, which is again, unheard of. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel there is a, a change which is happening for, for good. And uh, let's hope it continues. So Jay, thank you so much for being here today. I completely enjoyed our conversation and I look forward to many more in the series to come. We will be talking about very specific topics going forward. And uh, I encourage everyone, if you have questions, please go ahead, uh, write in the comment box and hopefully Jay Chauhan will be answering them for you. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Asha. I really appreciate the invitation. I really enjoyed the discussion. And I look forward to working with you and your group so that uh, other people can share our views as well. Absolutely. Um, I look forward to that. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. Now, bye from me and Public Allies. We will see you soon next week. Thank you. Take care. Bye.